Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Amen. Um, we've got a, a table on the board here. Uh, just as a quick review, uh, last time we talked about the Greeks and how they used the word soon adesis for the word conscience. Okay, do you remember who the two witnesses were for the, the conscience? For the Greeks? Yep, for the Greeks. Me, myself, and I. Yeah, that's three, but that works, yeah. Yes, me and me. Um, one being the observer who notes what's happening, the other being the evaluator, the one who judges later. Okay? And so they're seeing with each other. What's the result of this? When you sit and look back at what happened and judge, the result is potentially a, always a, bad conscience. In fact, there are very few references to good consciences in uh, Greek literature. Okay? I was thinking that might help <laughs> the people sitting here in front. It doesn't help me, but yeah, that'll be fine. What's the cure? Well, there's none. Yeah. There's none. So you're, you're left with a perpetually bad conscience. Um, the, the Stoics, they're, they're noted um, for at, at least looking at things and saying, well, I can do better tomorrow. And they have this practice in the evening talked about this with our teachers uh, about a year ago, about how they would how would they would go through and evaluate the day based on the societal standard, say, okay, here is where I have failed. And th in this we see kind of the reflective action of the conscience um, identifying sin, right? But the problem with that is that there's, there's no cure. You're just left there with your sin, okay? Um, this practice could could be rightly used by the Christian when praying the Lord's Prayer. Which petition? I know, we have to count in our heads, don't we? We want to say the fifth petition. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So rightly you could go through and consider your day as you're falling asleep, or before you fall asleep, and pray, oh Lord, forgive me these things. And unlike the Stoic who sits there and says, well, I'll do better tomorrow, you can go to sleep in confidence knowing that these things are forgiven. Okay? So uh, moving on to the Hebrews, they're really the Old Testament. Who were their witnesses? Me. Yep. And. God. Okay? Result is that the conscience could be good or bad, right? Depends on what God is saying about you. That's key. What does God say about you? Okay? The cure. When, when I know that I have sinned, the cure is then what God says about you, such as in Psalm 51 where we hear, create in me a clean heart, O God. So the cure for the bad conscience is to listen to God. Okay? And now what we're going to be doing is moving to the, the New Testament, where we hear continued use of the word leb, which comes across as cardia in Greek. Uh, but we also see that within the writings of Peter and Paul, we have the word soonadesis creep in. But now we do find that there is a cure, which for their Greek audiences is critical, right? So if, if you have grown up in a Greek-speaking culture and you come to this conclusion that there's no cure to the conscience, that it's just always um, prickled by sin, uh, then there becomes very little hope other than trying to deal with it yourself. And how can you deal with it yourself? Okay. So what we actually see within the, the Gospels is that the word heart continues to be used with the exception of John 8 verses 1 to 10. Now, 
I'm going to read this in the ESV, but I need somebody who may have um, a, a King James version of the Bible. Um, New King James probably also would work for this. Okay? So we, we need somebody with one of those to read after I read. Okay? <coughs> and I guess it's... We're going to go all the way through 11. Key verse, though, is 9. So here's, here's John chapter 8. 1 through 11. Uh, they went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women, so what do you say? This, they said, to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground, and as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground, but when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Okay, so uh, anybody with a New King James Version notes something different in the text? No? Okay, anybody with a King James Version in here? Yeah, Thomas has one? It's verse 9 that we want to hear from the King James Version. Then those who heard it began convicting by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. Okay, so the, the manuscripts are split on verse 9. In some of the manuscripts, they, they have the word for conscience and convicted in the conscience in there. And other manuscripts, they don't. Okay? Um, now, given the rest of the, the witness in the, the New Testament, specifically the Gospels, it's very unusual that you'd have the word uh, conscience, sunodasis, in there. Because primarily, we hear the, the word heart being used. So this is the only occurrence, and this in... Not all of the manuscripts where you have the idea of conscience inserted. Okay? Um, so what can we conclude from that? Generally in the Gospels, as we hear from Jesus, when we hear about the word conscience, we hear the word heart being used. Okay? So if you're thinking about conscience and reading through the Gospels and say, well, conscience isn't in here anywhere. Well, yes, it is. Look for the word heart. Secondly, this is most likely an insert of kind of this Jewish idea, which does also apply to the Greeks that the conscience would act as one that convicts. Okay? And so in, in a section of the Gospel of John, which is already contested, right, uh, we don't look to ground our idea of conscience from that. Okay? But we do go on to look at 1 John 3 and then the writings of Peter and Paul to gain a better understanding of our conscience and how we might help people in the present day to understand what they're dealing with and the solution to their conscience. Okay, So what we're going to do next is look at 1 John 3, focusing in on verses 19 to 20. Um, and, and then I'd we're going to take a little side trip into 1 John chapter 5, just, just as a brief note there, okay? And then we'll move on to Peter and 1 Peter chapter 3, okay? So uh, a volunteer to read 1 John 3, verses 19 to 20. Thank you, Jack. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart... God is greater than our heart, 
and knows all things. Behold, or, I'm sorry, beloved, if your heart does not condemn us, if, I'm sorry, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. And whoever, whatever we ask, if we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, I went too far. It's okay. Th this was good to hear too. Okay? Um, first off, who is one of the witnesses that's identified here in, in 1 John chapter 3? Who witnesses? Ah, we do. And it's specifically, John is noting our heart, which is the conscience. Okay, So me, who's the other witness? Ah, God. <laughs> and, and here's what's big, right? Um, I can carry around within myself all sorts of guilt regarding my past sin and begin to believe that God is not going to forgive those things. But John directly contradicts this, right? The Holy Spirit is trying to comfort you. <laughs> He's saying, God is greater, stronger than your heart. And he speaks a better word and a better witness. Okay? So... If my, if my heart is bad because of sin, then the cure is to, again, listen to God. But there's more here for us. Okay? And that's what we're, we're going to hear from, from Peter in just a minute. But let's continue on with this idea of witnesses. Because John goes on to talk more about the witness in 1 John chapter 5, okay? So we want to flip there. We are focusing in on verses 6 through 12. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God, that he is born concerning the Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar, because he's not believed in the testimony that God has born concerning his Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us, eternal life. And this is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Now, we can be even more specific at this point about who the second witness is according to 1 John chapter 5. Who is that? The Spirit. The Spirit. And he is giving the, the better testimony. So, you, you, again, you're thinking about that picture of the court of law. And here is the judge. And here you are, the plaintiff. And here is the prosecutor, which happens to be your conscience, your heart. And, and all of this is going before the judge, all of these accusations. But who do you have on your side? The Spirit giving the witness with water and blood. Which means that you are being tied right back to the cross, right back to Christ's work. And these happen concretely. Okay? It's, it's not chance that water and blood are being used here. And I want to build uh, the, the evidence for this by then looking at 1 Peter chapter 3. Okay, but, but John is mentioning water especially because what ties you to Jesus and his death and resurrection? Yeah. And so it, it's not just listening to God that gives you the good conscience, but it, 
It's this concrete moment within my life, within your life, where you have been taken into the family of God and joined to Christ Jesus so that you can have confidence to stand before the Father on the last day. You don't have to walk around with uncertainty regarding your sin and your guilt. Okay? Instead, you know that there everything has been taken care of. Okay, now 1 Peter chapter 3. And we're looking at verses 13 to 20. And again, volunteer to read. You got it? Yeah. Thank you, Nathan. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you suffer, if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being, being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. And now verse 21. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. So, in this text, it is very, very clear. What's, what's the appeal to God for a good conscience? Baptism. Baptism. Okay, now, it, is this more than a washing away of dirt when they pour water over the top of, well, when we poured water over the top of Bryce's head? It's pretty cute. Still is cute, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> but, but is it more than uh, a washing away of dirt? What is it then? It's a washing away of sin. sin. And then God's speaking, right? This is, this is the work of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit unto you. So it's not just listening to what God says about you, but being joined to him that gives the good conscience. So what, what do I do then when, when I am feeling the weight of my sin? Well... Return to your baptism. That is confession and absolution. Right? There again, God speaks. And he speaks a better word than the blood of Abel, which cries out for vengeance because of the crime that was committed against him. For this, now we want to turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Okay? In exegetical study this last week, we were reading Hebrews chapter 12, which is so beautiful. And if you need something to read right now, you're like, oh, what, what book of the Bible should I read? Well, if you're reading in the Treasury of Daily Prayer, uh, you got to read <laughs> uh, 1 Kings chapter 1 today, and also 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But if you're not reading that, read this, right? Hebrews is a beautiful letter of comfort, especially in uh, a time where you might be facing persecution or suffering. Okay, so we're, we're looking now at, at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 all the way through 24, the full assurance of faith. Okay, a volunteer to read 10, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 19 to 24. 
or sorry, Hebrews chapter 10. I know I said the wrong thing there. Yeah. I can read it, but I have a page of these. <laughs> That's great. All read right. away. All right. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. And read 25 too. Yeah. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching. Okay, so here in the, in the book of Hebrews, uh, conscience and heart are tied together, aren't they? So look, look back, look back at verse 22. How are heart and conscience tied together? Heart sprinkled. Heart sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. And so here we see the, the joining of these two terms. But again, what's being used? Water. A reference to holy baptism. So that the, the heart can approach God with confidence, drawing near unto him. And in Hebrews, a lot of this is talking about the divine service. And we think about these things sometimes um, just as, as far as the end times, like how can I approach God? Well, how can I approach God now? Because is God present in the divine service? And we would say with certainty, yes, right? Christ is here with us in this place now. He's drawn near, visited his people to forgive them their sins and to bring them to the Father. Okay? So, then the, the heart is cleansed, sprinkled clean, baptism, so that the conscience is no longer evil. If the conscience is no longer evil, the conscience is good. So now I have a clean and good heart and a clean and good conscience. Now, I would add, it says a, a true heart. That's what a good heart. True is. heart. Thank so you. Use the true word of God, right? Yeah. Well, and all of these words, uh, it, it's like a whole range of words that end up being used in the Old Testament for uh, the heart, clean and true and good. Pure. Um, I, I wanted to read chapter 12 too, though you won't necessarily hear any conscience language here. It's, it's just a really good section of Hebrews. Okay? Um, so this, this begins with verse 3. Do not grow weary is the title the ESV gets, gives it. Uh, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you've not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, don't regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It's for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father doesn't discipline? If you're left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but... He disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the fr peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. 
And here's the section we spent some time on in exegetical study. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent though he sought it with tears. For you've come not to me be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and tempest and the sound of trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to the Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels in festal gathering, the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Now, all of this is giving a description of the divine service, but also what's happening in heaven, right? And how in the world do you approach the living God who once spoke the law and the people said, no, we don't want to hear that voice anymore. Moses, you speak for us. Well, it's now through the blood. The blood that speaks a better word than Abel. The blood that says this is the New Testament of my blood for the forgiveness of your sins. And so in this then, we're not just listening to what God has to say, uh, simply listening to the word, but God joins himself to means, to the wine, his blood there for your forgiveness, so that the conscience which goes around saying, ah, look at all the terrible things that I've done, doesn't appeal to its own works, doesn't appeal to something that's in concrete, but instead the concrete God. Okay? So this is a rather beautiful thing for us, especially as, as Lutherans. We sit here and say, how is my conscience then good? In these places. And this is why then it's a real delight to come to the divine service on a Sunday, because there... Christ gives himself for me so that I have the sureness of a conscience made clean by him. Now, this gets back, back then to the kind of the present day, okay? Um, and we'll, we'll parse this out a little bit more next week, I think, too. But in our present day, one of the witnesses for the conscience is me. Who is the other witness? Yeah, Some, something in the world. Um, in Colorado, I, I was uh, at a place and they didn't have any recycling bins. And I thought to myself, what am I going to do with these plastic things? I, I have a strong desire personally to recycle, so we've got a, like a re little recycling bag and a recycling bin at our house and all that. But I'm like, what am I going to do? This is what's right. You should recycle. And then I look around and I'm like, well, I can't take it in my car. It's going to get trashy. I guess I'll throw it in the trash. But what does the world say? Recycle. Throw it out. Throw it on the, rail, on the roadside. <laughs> oh, the poor one. Okay. But, but there, are, there are other voices in the world which are informing the conscience, right? And we know this. Brian Wolfmuller talked about that. Okay. What's the result? Well, depending on how faithfully you're following this example of judgment, okay, the conscience may be bad or seemingly good based on how closely you follow the law. And this is 
This is not God's law necessarily. It can be if it follows the law. Like they say, don't murder. If you murder, you're going to go to jail. At least that's the way it should be. <laughs> okay? If you don't get caught, that's another matter. But, but the world sometimes then does have God's law in the sense that it follows the Ten Commandments, but then it also imposes other laws. Okay? But what's the solution to a bad conscience here? The same thing, I think, as the Greeks try harder. Okay? And this leaves me in, in a position where I try and try and try. And maybe if I do a better job than my neighbor, I feel pretty good. But on the other hand, when I take a look at how energy conscious they happen to be, they've got one of those Teslas. I think a Tesla looks pretty cool, but I don't have one. Okay? Then I begin to despair of my efforts, which goes back to the nature of the law, right? If I live by the law, I may be either prideful or despairing. In despair, this is where I desperately need Jesus. Because he speaks a better word than Abel's, which cries for vengeance and condemnation. Jesus speaks the word of forgiveness. Now, there's more on the conscience here, and we have to dwell a little bit on Paul's writings from 1 Corinthians chapters 8 and 10. That's what we'll look at next week. The week after... Uh, Missionary David Bush will be here to give a presentation on his work in Southeast Asia. Specifically, he was in Hong Kong. He can't go back there. So they're trying to work things out in Taiwan so that he can, he can uh, work there um, in expanding the deaf ministry. Uh, so he'll be doing a presentation on September 4th. There's no Sunday school that day. Uh, if you would like to be a Sunday school teacher... Yeah, we're, we're starting things back up in full September 12th. Um, the elders, as well as the pastors, were talking about some, some people who might be good for that. And so you, you would have received then a letter in your bulletin, uh, not your a letter in your uh, mailbox uh, over at church. We identified some candidates. But there are more of you who are, are, are out there who could teach. Some of you... Um, we, we dropped your names because you're already extremely busy. And so I was going to put a, a letter in Jerry Roberts' mailbox, and then I thought, <laughs> Jerry already does everything else. That's not a good idea. Okay? So don't feel badly if you didn't get a letter, Jerry. I'm, I'm like, you've already got enough on your plate, buddy. Okay? Um, so uh, please, please carefully consider that if you, if you didn't get a letter. Um, that doesn't mean we don't think we, you would be a bad teacher. Okay? It just may be that, that we're, we're thinking maybe at this point in your life you're already extremely busy. Or if you think, oh, they're wrong, oh, let, then please, let Forrest Gaffney know. Okay? Because he would love to have teachers kind of set up for uh, one, uh, like a fall trimester and a spring trimester, and then work things out in the summer as people have vacations and stuff. And we'd love to have substitute teachers at, at hand to then go on and, and fill in for the teachers who may not be feeling well uh, or may be on a vacation or something like that, okay? So uh, with, with that final announcement, uh, leave things open for questions and then we'll pray. Kim. I just worry because as you're writing that down, I, when I grew up, there was the law that was being followed I felt like even if people weren't Christians, they were at least trying to be good people and follow the law. And yet today, and I'm not on social media, <laughs> but I still feel that there's this attitude that nobody should ever despair, nobody should ever feel bad, so everything is good, and you should accept 
whatever people do. Sure. So it wouldn't wouldn't that be interesting if if we go from the world back to me? I think that's where it's going. Maybe. Jack? Well, antinomianism is legalism and legalism is antinomianism. It's true. So there was a Slate article recently about a girl who was feeling guilty about feeling guilty that she was sexually promiscuous. If she should be able to be sexually promiscuous and feel good about it because it shows her personal autonomy. So we, so we have a cult of personal autonomy, which again, organically grows out of consumerism and mass democracy. And so if the ethos is centered around setting up rules to prevent people from obeying rules, because when you, you, when you, you the only way of getting rid of the law as a threat is to fulfill the law through the blood of Jesus. But if you simply get rid of the law and set up antinomianism, then you have to set up a bunch of rules to prevent people from obeying the law. So, <laughs> right? Right. So, so the transgender people come and say, you're, you're an oppressor, you're trying to force me into my you know, assigned sex at birth and to play out a certain set of rules. Uh, and now I will condemn you because I've now set up a new set of rules to protect my antinomianism. So, and it just creates a new set of rules. On the other hand- They're very concerned with maintaining that righteousness themselves, right? Right, and like, you're righteous. So you always have to, like, you have to do the work constantly. Right. Right. Of course, legalism is also antinomianism because then to, to get the law to be obeyable, you have to cut down a bunch of rules. So you, it's like Catholics do with creating all kinds of loopholes and so forth. Mm -hmm. but, um, right. And also give uh, some kind of authority, carte blanche, with, uh, to enforce the rules, right? So the, what the authority does doesn't matter anymore. They can do whatever they want just as long as they're forcing those set of rules. So, so yeah. So we, we're arguably, in many ways, in more hyper legal although the average Christian will think, yeah, they're just all running wild now. But that's actually not true. It's, it's much more frightening than legalistic. I think it's frustrating, yeah, it's frighteningly legalistic now. It's terrifying how legalistic that needs to sound. It's, it's obviously an absolute despair. My favorite case with a friend is um, in order to atone for his sins, he's literally used this language. He's like not eating meat, but like to balance like the just like the, the food discomfort if people are serving him the meat, he has to do like a moral calculus in his head. Oh. Think about how we're suffering to the people serving the meat oh. and not like him like saying no to it. Then like if he ate the meat. So like every meal has to be like a moral calculus to like to, so that he can like atone for a certain amount of like bad in the world. Mm -hmm. Not exactly how it works with God's law too, which is why we really, really, really need grace, so that we're not constantly making those moral decisions all the time. You can say, "It's all right. I, I can just, I can just do whatever I'm doing." Right? Uh, so, I, I, as listening to Joe Kreese's and the brilliant analysis, it, is that why some are calling this more puritanical yes. than before? Yes. That, would you guys agree with that? Yeah, I mean, yes. it's, a, it's a secularized version. Yeah. Puritans. Well, also say, yes, it's, um, yeah, but of course, it, it's now, since people can't imagine transcendence anymore, everything is about mm -hmm. salvation here on Earth. And so mm -hmm. you've got to pummel people enough to fix things here on Earth because yeah. after that, that's what happens if like there's no you're stuck in an imminent frame, right? And then if there's no afterlife, then like you have to fix everything now. Mm -hmm. Right. And so then everything is ratcheted up to like eleven on the importance mm -hmm. level. Right. So they just get increasing radicalization from everybody because yeah. you have to fix everything now, right? Everything is hyper important. Mm -hmm. Wow. So at what point does this whole thing finally break down? It's a constant cycle. Yeah. It's, 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 history's shown this. I mean, yeah. it's constant. I think the pieces are falling out and they're desperately trying to get them while they fall out, right? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's like when you're at the beach and you've decided 
that you're going to alter the course of a stream, right? So you begin digging things out, um, but the stream keeps flowing over the top of everything that you've just dug, and the waves come and alter everything anyway. Yeah, we have so little control. Thankfully, we have peace from that. Amen. Well, we have, yeah, we have peace in Christ. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, uh, we give you thanks for the greater witness that you give than our hearts, which condemn us because of our failures to keep the law, whether it be man-made or your divinely given law, but especially this work of Christ, which forgives all of our sins against you, dear Father. In addition to hearing his voice, uh, let us always look to the, the places where you've concretely joined us to your Son in holy baptism and also in the Lord's Supper. And give to us the words which can bring comfort to our neighbors, that their consciences too may be at peace with you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.